Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. My name is Nikolai, and today's presenters are Melissa Binks and Alistair McPherson. Melissa is our HR manager, and Alistair is one of our directors. He will jump in later on. He is busy with, um, I think, one of his clients. But since the topic is primarily about uh, employment and chaplaincy, and it's called churches and chaplains and HR and employment law perspective. Uh, Melissa will have a lot of insights and a lot of information for you to consume today. And I hope it's going to be interesting. A couple of um, things I need to tell you about. At the end of the webinar, you can ask questions. I have this tab called questions where you can type questions as we go and then we will see them in the end. Uh, also during the webinar, Melissa is going to ask you questions and the, she would like to see some answers for these questions and you can use another tab called chat. So in that chat tab, you can type away uh, a question or uh, to interact with Melissa this way. And with that, I'll also at the end of the webinar, once the webinar is finished and all recorded, you'll receive um, a link by email, which will allow you to uh, view or share this webinar with your colleagues or save it for later. And for those who did not attend today, they will also receive a link. And this way they will be able to catch up and watch this um, useful and informative webinar. With that, I'll pass the microphone to Melissa and we will start the official webinar. I'll just switch also to the slides. Thank you. Great, thanks, Nick. And um, thanks everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Um, just to give you a little bit of, of um, my background, before I started working for um, Corny and Lind as the um, HR manager, I actually spent a number of years um, as the employee relations manager for Scripture Union Queensland. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of insight into, um, into why I guess I have some knowledge on, on this topic. Um, I just want to also let you know that I'm very aware that chaplaincy and what it looks like can change dramatically from school to school and even between states and territories. So um, so by no means what we talk about today is it black and white for your circumstances. It can actually change depending on the type of school and, and where it's located in Australia. Um, firstly, I would like just to ask some questions to get some understanding of, um, of our listeners today and, and, and how, you know, you're working with chaplains or, or alongside chaplains. Um, can you let me know in the chat window that Nick told you about um, if you already have a chaplain as a start? So do you already have a chaplain that you support in some way? All right. Um, another question. Um, are you a church who's already who's looking to support a chaplain? Um, and the other question is, um, if you already have a chaplain, is it an independent or government school or a private school where you're supporting that chaplain? Okay, great, thank you. So um, let's move on to what we're covering. So um, today in, in, um, in the presentation, we're going through um, just some basic chaplaincy facts that I've picked up, um, how churches can help chaplains qualifications and skills. Um, um, social media appropriateness and other key code of conduct keys and walking the straight line, working within your boundaries. 
and what to do when there's a breach of the code of conduct that is not a breach of employment law. Um, so some of the facts that I thought you might find interesting because as, as we all understand um, chaplaincy, particularly around um, uh, voting time with, um, with you know, new, new government coming in can receive a lot of negative attention at times. Um, the, the statistics that I've gathered here are from um, the Government Department of Education and Training. They did um, an evaluation of the NSCP funding um, that they completed in 2018 so that they could see how effective it was basically and that's what some of these stats come from. So 91% of parents actually support having chaplaincy services in their schools um, and 85% of principals report being extremely satisfied with the NSCP services. Down the left hand side of that slide you can see the types of contact chaplains have with students. So um, low contact, medium and large is, is within a group um, or an activity context of how many students in those schools reported contact and individual contact is like one-on-one -on -one pastoral informal and formal conversations. So this slide here um, shows us how chaplains actually spend their time. So we've got an example there of government independent and Catholic schools. Um, and you can see how they're spending their time between classroom support, informal support, which is their conversations, um, a lot of their one-on-one -on -one time, breakfast club or food programs, delivery of religious studies, family support and community engagement. Um, and in, in, the, in the statistics, they found that around 8 in 10 principals, 9 in 10 chaplains and 6 in 10 parents considered chaplaincy to be extremely effective in dealing with sense of purpose and self-esteem, peer relationships, social inclusion and self-image. It was also interesting to note that the only thing that they actually wished, 95% um, of them wished that they could improve about the chaplaincy service would be more hours for the chaplains in their schools. So how can churches help chaplains prepare for recruitment? What does a potential chaplain need to know, um, which includes their qualifications, skills and experience? What do they actually do? Because there are huge differences between what a chaplain does and what youth leaders do. And what do you need to know? Qualifications and experience, that actually is the same across the whole of Australia. So minimum qualifications for chaplains under government funding are a certificate for in youth work or pastoral care. Um, pastoral care. It has to be um, the equivalent of that or higher, and it has to include the two minimum units, um, responding to client issues and working with people with mental health issues. Um, equivalent or higher, that is usually measured on a case-by-case -case basis, but it does include psychology, social work or education um, with specific requirements around each one, depending on the state that you're in. So the experience in, so this is straight from um, the government's requirements of their experience, is in providing support to children and young people and their families, delivering well-being. Um, and obviously the ability to provide pastoral care, advocacy and critical incident response. Chaplains can often spend a lot of time dealing with um, trauma that happens inside the schools, supporting schools and teachers in identifying the vulnerable and at risk and, and obviously putting support programs and referrals around them, um, supporting those in, um, impacted by trauma and that can be in the school or outside of the school and liaising with community service organisations, government agencies, etc. So um, it's always important to remember that a chaplain's job is to, you know, provide that initial support and, and then when it's too big, refer on to the appropriate people because they're not counsellors. So what is the difference between a chaplain and a youth leader? So I looked up the definition of um, of what they look like and, and also um, from my own experience as, as a youth leader, you know, a number of years ago and my understanding of chaplain, chaplaincy as to what they actually do. So a youth leader is obviously someone who has a responsibility for the young people at church. Fundamentally, their role is to make disciples who will go on to then make their own disciples. They lead people in the growth of their faith. Their role can be expressed in many different ways, friend, encourager, um, for example, you know, they might spend time as a skateboard instructor, Bible teacher, a prayer partner, a motivator, maths tutor, mentor and many, many more. Things that they may 
do in their role as a youth leader is pray directly for young people, perhaps depending on your church with the laying of hands. Um, they can use their personal mobile phones and forms of social media to communicate, you know, depending on your church policy. They can relate, they lead religious practices. They're allowed to proselytize and ask for public responses and um, and they could actually do home visits and drive young people in their car depending on, on your church's practices. Interesting to note that a chaplain cannot do any of the, the above in, in a role as a chaplain. So a chaplain definition, a Christian who is responsible for the religious needs of the organisation. A chaplain is essentially a spiritual representative attached to a secular organisation, a good majority of the time, not always. Some chaplains are expected to represent multiple faiths, acting as a sort of neutral spiritual resource. Chaplains provide social, emotional and spiritual support for school communities. They contribute to the overall wellbeing strategies and educational goals of the local schools. So those last two sentences there, that's actually what um, the government has put together and that's what they're actually measuring when they're looking to understand the impact a chaplaincy service has on a school. So what do chaplains do? They can hold one-on-one -on -one pastoral conversations and as we saw that they, they do a lot of that. They run programs and activities that provide well-being and life skills such as um, friends and resilience and um, you know saying no to drugs and bullying programs and all sorts of things. They can feed impoverished children through things like breakfast clubs um, or, or lunch clubs where they might have some spare meals. They provide a safe space in the school. Um, build strong key relationships that provide hope and light to that young person because of God who works through that chaplain and connect the young person and or the family with the church if the opportunity presents itself. So there's a lot more rules around a chaplain than a youth leader, but um, you, you can kind of see that at the end of the day, they're all still working towards the same goal. So school chaplains are generally held to account under the same conduct and standards of practice as teachers under state schools. And that makes it a very um, interesting space to, to look after uh, because um, schools, you know, have very different rules to, to from state to state even, but then also compared to, to what we would like them to do as a chaplain or, or perhaps how they work as a youth leader and, and that's where things can be can be challenging. Um, I used to um, teach all of the new chaplains that came on in block recruitments on the code of conducts of the school and, and it certainly made for some um, interesting conversation. So some of the things that um, the standards of practice um, and the codes of conduct that employees within the school are held to, which they will expect the chaplains to abide by, include electronic communication um, with students is unacceptable. That includes mobile phones and social networking. Obviously, that creates some challenges um, when you're a youth leader, perhaps, and, and the way that you communicate with your youth group is over social media. So we you know, we help them work around that by talking about different ways social media can be used and putting themselves one step away from that. Students must not be driven in private vehicles. Um, you cannot spend time with students in small groups or alone in social settings. So that means you, you can't take them out for coffee outside of the school or, or go and have a meal with them with your chaplaincy hat on. You should not make home visits and interact, interactions with students must be and seem to be, so it's all about perception there, professional at all times. This includes outside of school hours and um, that helps avoid perceptions of grooming, which can be a very blurry space. So I've got a little story um, that I want to tell you um, about, you know, what what blurring the boundaries can, can look like. Um, so there was a primary school chaplain that we're going to call Jane, who was passionate about working in schools and with young people. Jane regularly provided support to the prep class and would help the teacher with activities. Jane came to be familiar with a little boy we will call Tom and his dad. On a few occasions, when Tom arrived for class, he would run up to the chaplain and want to hug. This was in front of Tom's dad, who never said or showed that this was an issue. Tom was a particularly anxious one week and told the chaplain it was because he was scared about going away over the weekend and sleeping in a different bed. The prep class had a stuffed elephant, which was used as a special comfort toy. When a child was upset or having a bad day, they were allowed to look after the elephant. 
but it stayed at school. This particular day, Chaplain Jane could see how anxious Tom was feeling and told him as long as he didn't tell anyone else, Jane would let him take the elephant away for the weekend, and so Tom did. The elephant came back to class on the Monday and everything went on as usual. A number of weeks later, the chaplain was running a craft activity in the prep class and was showing the students how to make a bookmark. Jane's bookmark broke and she put it aside to make another one. Tom asked her if he could keep the broken one. Jane said no, as she did not have enough for everyone. Tom asked again, and so Jane said he could have her broken bookmark as long as he promised not to tell anyone. A few days later, Tom's parents made a complaint to the school that Chaplain Jane was behaving inappropriately with their son and had been grooming him. They provided examples of physical contact where they had hugged before school, that Tom had been allowed to sit on Jane's lap during story time, and that Jane had given Tom gifts on more than one occasion where he was told to keep them a secret. Tom's parents wanted the police involved. Jane was stood down from her role pending investigation, and although there was never any reason to believe there was malicious intent, she had worked outside of professional boundaries a number of times and so lost her job, not even to mention the emotional devastation to her personally to experience such an ordeal. So working within the boundaries can be the most challenging part of working as a chaplain. Um, and as you would likely relate, chaplains are generally heart people or servant hearted and will often go above and beyond the call of duty to love on people. However, it's crucial that this is done within the boundaries set by the school and the employing authority. When a chaplain steps into a school community, it's like there's a big sign on their head saying, I'm a Christian and you can hold me to a higher moral expectation than you would yourself. Working with this in mind and with the boundaries will make for a long and successful calling in the role, allowing the chaplain to impact more young people. So working within the boundaries manages the perceptions of a broken and sceptical world, some of who are waiting for you to fail, builds trust with key leaders in the school and parents, which results in greater freedoms, can provide character protection if someone brings allegations against the chaplain, sets up the chaplain to work within the role for many years, impacting um, more young people by reducing the likelihood of misperceptions or character devastating allegations and healthy boundaries that support health care, self care and well-being in a spiritually and emotionally heavy role. So basically to, to you know sum up that slide, working within the boundaries um, protects the chaplain for their own self-care and for the longevity of, of the work they're actually doing in that school community. So what to do when there's a breach on the code of conduct that is not a breach of the employment law. Conflicts between codes of conduct and legislation may include religion, so active church and active church membership expectations, so that can look like um, you know, some people and legislation can say that it's discrimination to employ people based on their religion. Um, active church membership expectations, so that can come down to what the church expects a relationship between two adults to look like um, and perhaps what the world says is normal um, and which leads into lifestyle, marital, status, sexual orientation, etc. If the if the chaplain has extra jobs on the side that the people that the church perhaps believes conflicts with their role as a chaplain, etc. So if there's a breach, what do you do? Firstly, be aware it's the employing authority that has the legal responsibility. So if if you as the church are the employing authority, obviously you have the responsibility to manage the um, the chaplain's employment and the situation. If you're involved in a support um, committee like a ch local chaplaincy committee or similar around the chaplain, then um then it's actually going to be the employing authority that are responsible for paying that chaplain that you need to take up the conversation with. They'll be the 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 organisation managing the risk for that one. Um, seek legal advice, especially if you are the employing authority. It's a very difficult space to work, and it's and it's not something that we would ever recommend that you um that you try and walk alone. Um, one of the best ways can handle it can be to have an informal, smart conversation to help the chaplain self-reflect. Um, I guess that's a technique that um, that I have used a couple of times where you, you get the chaplain to think about what, 
what what are their priorities in life at the moment, where they're heading, um, and what the school is expecting of them, and what the church community is expecting of them, and whether there is a misalignment between those. Um, be aware that the school often has the right under the education department to ask the chaplain to leave because they are a guest in the school and not an employee, and that can actually be done um, effectively immediately in the moment. It makes for a very interesting space because sometimes um, it can be the church that says, actually, we're not happy with the way the chaplain's behaving, and sometimes it can actually be the school to take you by surprise and and, um, and be holding the chaplain to an expectation that you never saw coming. So um, in conclusion, Supporting the chaplain or working as a chaplain can be high re highly rewarding. Personally, I think God was very strategic when he decided to put a representative of himself in each school community. Hearing everything that is involved can be scary, but if the chaplain works within the boundaries and keeps their school principal, employer and community support in the loop as relevant, the work they can do can have eternal impacts. Let me finish with a good story. So there were two teenage siblings whose mum was sadly dying of a terminal illness. The chaplain in that school worked closely alongside the teenagers and the mum through this difficult time to help the mother process her grief of leaving her children behind and support her teenagers in processing their grief. The mum and chaplain put a box together that was filled with cards and letters for all the important milestones such as birthdays, graduations, weddings, birth of their children and just general letters of love and encouragement for different stages of their life. When the teenager's mum passed away, the chaplain was charged with passing the special box onto the children, helping prepare and leave a gift that would bring healing well beyond the teenager's connection with the chaplain. What a blessing and a way to impact their lives. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. I'd just like to remind you also that we, um, we have Alistair in the room, so if you have any questions that you would like to ask around anything that we've discussed, um, please let us know now. All right. Well, thank you for um, for that very uh, helpful presentation, uh, Melissa. Uh, and I'm sure you'll all agree that whilst this is a, uh, a challenging area, it's a um, it, it is a really beneficial one for, for churches and for Christians to be involved in. And um, so we, we do thank you for that, Melissa. As I said, um, I'm in uh, here and I can answer any questions you might have. It's Alistair McPherson. Uh, so if you had any questions, by all means, uh, put them through now. Uh, otherwise, if you wanted to send an email to us, you can also do that as well. Uh, but, yeah, thank you, uh, Melissa. It doesn't look like any questions are coming through, so uh, we can bring the webinar to a, to a close. Uh, thank you for those who have attended. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you, and we'll um, see you next time. Bye-bye.